Good morning, everyone. Whether you are here by Zoom or you are here in body, we are happy to have you with us. And if it looks like I was going from thing to thing, we have uh, our youth got together this morning and they're writing the Christmas pageant. So we had a working writing session this morning and they had a lot of ideas and questions. So we needed to take the time to do that. So yay, uh, it's wonderful that the season brings us all together and that these stories, which are so important to us are being passed down to new generations. We will, of course, move to congregational prayers shortly, but for the life of the church and the community, are there any announcements you want to make about? Go ahead, Linda. Um, microphone? You need a microphone? Wendy's got the microphone. We always have to include everybody, and so we speak through microphones so that those who are in Zoom can hear what's being shared here in the sanctuary. Bear with us a moment, we're turning it on. Got it. Um, we just, the mission committee is sponsoring um, two families of two children each, the angels and elves, and we just put a giving tree out in the front narthex. And if you'd like to take a tag and purchase a gift for a child, please feel free. If you want to take a couple of tags, you're welcome to. We just ask you to sign up on the sheet next to the tree so we know who took what gift. So when it doesn't show up, we know who to call. And if there's a note on it to wrap, it would help us if you wrap, but you don't have to. If there's no note about wrapping, please don't wrap. The parents don't want the gifts wrapped. They'd rather do it themselves. But we hope everybody will um, participate. The deadline is the first Sunday in December by noontime, and that's a really important deadline. So if you're not going to make it, please call me so I can figure something out. And if you're out there on Zoom and you'd like to participate by sending a check, Mark for Angels and Elves, we'll do the shopping for you. Great. Uh, Sue has one and so does Kit. Yep. Also, I delivered the calendars to the Gibson Center and they were thrilled to get them and they need more. So if you get calendars that you don't want, the box is out front here for you to put them in. Thanks. Also at the way station, we were, we needed to help a infant, but we did not have, we did not have winter clothes for an infant. So I'm thinking of something of nature, like a sack or uh, something that could fit various size babies, but I had nothing. So if you can help us at the way station, it's appreciated with needs for a baby. Okay, we probably want to post that to a Facebook page and be really specific on size because we can also source that from parents that have already had that plus the Freiburg thrift shop has a lot of that kind of stuff. So we, uh, we want to be careful in our asking so that we don't as a way station get inundated with things that we can only we only have a couple families that need that. So let's um, put our heads together soon and be really specific on that request. Other announcements for the life of the church? Anything in Zoom? Anybody in Zoom need to share anything? There is a box in the right coat closet now for donations to the way station. Please do not put gifts for angels and elves in there. <laughs> Keep those separate. <laughs> um, and the infant that Sue is talking about is into 18 month old clothing. So okay, yeah, 18 months and up. Okay, um, maybe what we need to do is create a, a designated place where any gifts coming to angels and elves would be, there's a box out here in the front of the narthex, there's a box for angels and elves. So definitely place your stuff there if it's angels and elves. Any other announcements for the life of the church or the community? There will also be a council meeting this Wednesday, seven o'clock by Zoom. So if you are a leader in your team for this church, please do plan on attending. And as ever, 
for us to make decisions on behalf of the church that are binding, we need at least our quorum to show up. It's not a lot of people, and we do try to keep it to an hour, but we would appreciate your attendance if you are serving on any of those teams. Alan, we would love to center ourselves with your music. So Alan will lead us in centering music. Please arrive in this place, put your feet on the floor, relax your bodies, and prepare to enter this space. Please join us in the call to worship. You'll find it in your bulletin, or you'll see it on the screen if you are participating by Zoom. This comes from Isaiah 25. Like the holy mountain of Hebrew scripture, our mountains are also home to your people. People like us. You invite all people to gather. Yet we live here, here and now. And so you envision that we may gather to celebrate and feast. We can make room at the table for all peoples and serving each other until all have been fulfilled. Surely, this is the vision of our God. We trust in holy love. Grace has already saved us. Let us rejoice and be glad. So friends, this is the time in the service when we have been inviting people to place names on the branches through November of those that you are remembering. Uh, I think all the tags have been used up. So you're going to have to add more tags. So I'm going to suggest that if you want to add a name, write it at the bottom of your bulletin for now and place it there. And we'll place it on a tag and add it for you. I just want to make sure everybody's names are included. We will, of course, be adding John Pepper to the branches of our remembrance this week. And if there's anybody in Zoom who has not shared a name already, you can send it by chat. And again, we'll add it for you to the branches here in the church. As a reminder for those who, you know, Novembering is an interesting idea. It grew out of a church that was sharing two, the space with two different congregations. Um, and one congregation observes the Day of the Dead, and that was a really big um, cultural introduction for the more mainline Protestant church who had never celebrated Day of the Dead before. And they together came up with this idea of Novembering so that they would decorate the church for the Day of the Dead, but then people would continue to bring in pictures and place names for, throughout November 
And rather than it being one 24 hour period, we would honor those that we mourn and bring them into our space and into our lives for a month together. And so Novembering traveled from the Midwest to the church that I attended down in Massachusetts, and now it's up here. And it's a lovely way to recognize those that have been part of our journey. We turn now to the prayers of our congregation and our community. And we begin by asking that if there are any prayers that you have that you wish us to raise up out loud, that you will do so. We begin with prayers of concern. Then we move to prayers of celebration and gratitude. We hold a moment of silence. And then together, we conclude with the Lord's Prayer. Is there anyone in Zoom who has a prayer of concern that you wish to raise up out loud? If so, please unmute and go ahead and share it with us. I would like to lift a prayer up for Ray and Arden Schoen and their family. For Ray and Arden. Thank you, Sandy. Ray is home at, actually now, and that's good news. Um, as we know, Ray, is on the hospice service, um, but not quite in the same place that others who have been on the hospice journey have reached. But we hold Ray and Arden and their family in our prayers. Anyone else in Zoom who wishes to raise up a prayer of concern? Go ahead, Arden. I, I just want to thank everybody because um, I sure do need it right now. I really, really do. This is this is tough times with Ray, and I'm I'm not sure which direction we're we're going in. Um, he seems to be not quite ready for hospice, but I don't know. Uh, it's 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 a heck of a journey. I'll tell you that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Anyway. Pardon. Thank you for thinking of it in the first place. Mm. And those that have passed in the last couple of weeks, Joanne and John, both were able to be at home with their families, supported by hospice. This is an incredible commitment by a family and by caregivers. And it can still be arduous, and yet it is so humane. And so for the gift of being able to die surrounded by people you love in a place that is your home, we give thanks for that gift. Other prayers of concern here in the congregation, in the church. If you have one, please raise your hand so that the microphone can be carried to you. Who's got the microphone? Wendy, you're on. So we've got two hands up. We've got Linda, Tom, Meg, and maybe Sue. Bear with us as the microphone walks around the sanctuary to the other side. Okay. Please pray for Chloe, an 18-month-old baby in Texas whose blood platelets are all wrong. The pediatricians don't know what's the matter. She's trying to get into a pediatric hematologist to find out what's wrong. And her twin sister is fine, so she, Chloe's a real worry. For Chloe, an 18-month-old who needs the help of a hematologist. And there's Meg and Tom here, I believe. In another place with caregivers, I would like us to pray for caregivers, um, particularly now, caregivers in long-term care and in hospitals um, as they help um, folks transition at the end of their lives, too. The job is incredibly difficult, and sometimes there's not a lot of thanks there. So um, prayer for caregivers. Other prayers for the life of the church here in the sanctuary. Anybody else in Zoom that we didn't give a moment to yet for prayers of concern? Then I'm going to add some prayers to those that we're upholding that are prayers of concern. 
for families for whom we have continued to pray, for Huntley, for Scamp, for John Sullivan, for Sasha and her granddaughter Mary and Mary's heart, for the Brodels, for the Chernicks, for the Botsfords, always on a journey. For those who are living with grief, for the Corrigans, the Lundquists, for Ann Garland, the partner of Joanne Cleary, who died last week, for Alice Pepper, the wife of John Pepper, our beloved John, and for that whole family. For those that are living with cancer, for those who are journeying with dementia or Alzheimer's, for those living with ALS or Parkinson's, for so many different ways that the body, which is how we experience this wonderful world, are, is challenged and then inspires us because of resilience or strength or simply the grace about how people make the journey to be human. We think also of places in the world that require our attention, our love, our healing. We have a partner church, the Chikanga Church in the city of Mutare in the nation of Zimbabwe. Villages in Honduras visited by Meg. Places in the world where members of our own families live, work, serve, study. May holy love find the places that we know enough to name and the places that go unnamed but where love needs to be. And because we need some way to become resilient in times like these, we seek out prayers of gratitude and celebration. And as we approach the holidays, may we find ways to pay attention, to be mindful, and to see that even the smallest blessings are blessings indeed. Here in the sanctuary, are there prayers of gratitude or celebration that you wish to raise up out loud? If so, please raise your hands so that Wendy can bring you the microphone. Sue's got one. You know I'll give you a hard time if somebody isn't happy, so. Hopefully, if you had a chance to look at Mount Washington is frosted, beautiful. And Carter Notch, I looked out my front window, and it is gorgeous. My favorite, my favorite mountain. Mm -hmm. For the beauty of the changing seasons, Meg has a, a prayer of gratitude or celebration. I have a prayer of gratitude and celebration, um, but this is for Pastor Gail, Reverend Gail, so I hope mm. that you can come up front. Will the deacons come oh, up yeah. front with me? Will you come see us? <laughs> you want me to come down? Where can, can Zoom see us anywhere? Mm, how about if you guys come up, if okay. you're all right coming up. So it takes many um, hands to care for a church. Um, so many of you here do all kinds of things for this church, but we know that our pastor is the center of it all. And um, this we're celebrating five years of Reverend Gail being with us. And uh, Wendy bought the flowers. Cheryl wrote this beautiful note that I will read for you, but I think it really expresses how much we appreciate Gail being here. Dear Reverend Gail, it is hard to believe that it has been five years since you began as our pastor and teacher. Words cannot express how much we appreciate you and all that you do for our church family and the community. We are grateful for your love and caring, enthusiasm and energy, creative ideas and outreach efforts, thought-provoking sermons and practical thinking. Thank you for your dedication and sharing your faith and vision. God bless you. With love from the Jackson Community Church family. Thank you, guys. Sorry, I we love you. you. Okay, we're breaking all the rules and we're hugging. Uh-oh. 
but I couldn't see the words if I didn't take my mask off. <laughs> but we all know how, how important Reverend Gail is to us, and it really does take all of us to make this work together, but she certainly is our centerpiece. Thank you. I'm going to put that back down so just so everybody can see it. Thank you. That was, I didn't know about that. So that's a surprise. Thank you. My husband's been reminding me that we came to five years this month. I, I keep forgetting. Yeah, I, everything that happens in Zoom is my husband. He's, he's well, Sandy and Jeanette are also in there being de virtual deacons really for us. So uh, a whole team, thank you. And Alan <laughs> makes the sound work in, in the church, but it also has to work in the church, so it works in Zoom. So there's many of us, and we give thanks for all those that have been creative right through all of this. <laughs> Somebody's doing like uh, applause emojis. All right, well, that, that the sort of like a ritual melded into our prayer, but I do want to continue to invite prayers of celebration and gratitude here in the church. Is there anybody else here in the church that wants to say anything out loud? Okay, you guys, I'm going to pick on Zoom then. Is anybody in Zoom happy? Oh, good. Go ahead and uh, unmute if you are. Yeah, um, here in Ohio, we are having our first real snow with big fat flakes and it's covering the ground and the roofs. All right, from Jennifer. Gratitude for snow, we got snow in both places. Anybody else in Ohio, Jan? Yes, good morning. And I just wanted to say thank you for all the church community's prayers and reaching out to me and John. Um, it's been a tough year. I never expected to have to have back surgery on top of the cancer issues we've been dealing with. But um, everyone, I appreciate your cards and the uh, members that have reached out to us that offers of help. Um, I had my surgery uh, 10 days ago, I'm walking, I am moving around a little bit, and we're doing as well as we can do, and thank you. Thank you for sharing with us, Jan. It's good to have you with us. Any other prayers of gratitude or celebration? I'm going to make you guys say something happy. I'm just saying that now. Yeah, I, noticed, I, I do. Say again? I said uh, I do have... Um, I just need to say how grateful I am to the entire emergency ward people who are uh, took care of us for five days. And I do mean us. They just could not have been um, more caring, more sweet. They even hugged instead of the elbow bit, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, it got to that point where um, I just want to say it, it for for a tough experience it also had the good side that was Arden talking about race hospitalization recently um steve you were unmuted do you want to share well it was just real quick i just like the evolution of the zoom how you've added some new views um the current one i see of the entire church it is nice to see that because we haven't been able to see the church and yeah. then when everybody came up to the altar uh, Alan we're using his phone, the live shot of you guys, that, that enhances the service a lot. And it really makes us feel more like we're really in there. So thank you for that. Really looks are, great. And we're really grateful that you're continuing to Zoom because um, otherwise we wouldn't be, obviously wouldn't be able to engage as much as we have with our old friends and new friends in the congregation. Thank so you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, Chris and I continue to tinker with like the views and stuff like that because last week was a bit of a zoo with Wendy holding a, a phone so that we could um, include people and show different things that were going on. So we decided for the moment we're going to test having the whole church view so they can see everybody um, and see the sort of the wide panorama of everything. And we know that Zoom has created an inclusivity. It comes with more bells and whistles, and sometimes it's, we try not to have it be disruptive, but it means that people who, like Ray and Arden, are right here but need to stay home, or people that are far away, Ohio, Florida, other parts of the world, can participate. So 
we've learned a lot in the last 18 months, and these are lessons that we're continuing to keep so that we can continue to build community. I ask that you will now pray with me. Holy love, you connect us in unimaginable ways. You connect us in the hardest and most challenging of experiences and the most joyful of moments. You connect us across distance and time, across generations. And you are present always when we look for your love. We find the fingerprints of love all around us. And we are grateful. We have offered you prayers out loud, but we offer now our silence. And we lift up our voices together. If you're in Zoom, please unmute so we can hear your voices. You'll find the Lord's Prayer either in your bulletin or on the screen. Say whatever words you know and whichever ones you're comfortable with. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, will be done. As, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day of our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Lead us not into temptation, temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, kingdom, power, power and, and the glory forever. forever. Amen. Amen. So let's turn to our hymnals. Page 374 in the red hymnal that is called the Hymns of Truth and Light. I heard uh, rumors that there's a couple chalice hymnals floating around, which could be confusing if you turn to the same page in a different hymnal. And you'll also find the words up on your screen. So let's see, this is four. That's what I was just thinking. How many verses? One, two, three, five. I think we're just gonna do all five because it's a they're short, they're short verses. Please rise if you're able for the song. So, Alan, we're going to borrow your microphone for our readers. We have a poem by Joy Harjo called Perhaps the World Ends Here, followed by scripture that will be read by David. 
Sue Kerrigan is going to do the poetry reading for us. You'll find the text on the back of the Thank bulletin, you. yeah. or you'll find it on your screen if you want to follow along. Thank you, Alan. Perhaps the world ends here. The world begins at a kitchen table. No matter what, we must eat to live. The gifts of earth are brought and prepared, set on the table. So it has been since creation, and it will go on. We chase chickens or dogs away from it. Babies teeth at the corners. They scrape their knees under it. It is here that children are given instructions on what it means to be human. We make, we make men at it, we make women. At this table, we gossip, recall enemies and the ghosts of lovers. Our dreams drink coffee with us as they put their arms around our children. They laugh with us at our poor falling down selves. And as we put ourselves back together, once again at the table. And I'm gonna continue this because the text I think got cut off when I prepared the bulletin. This table has been a house in the rain, umbrella in the sun. Wars have begun and ended at this table. It is a place to hide in the shadow of terror, a place to celebrate the terrible victory. We have given birth at this table and have prepared our parents for burial here. At this table, we sing with joy, with sorrow. We pray of suffering and remorse. We give thanks. Perhaps the world will end at the kitchen table while we are laughing and crying, eating of the last sweet bite. Thank you, David. Isaiah 25, six through nine. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day, they will say, surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord we trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Mark 2, 13 through 17, Jesus calls Levi. Jesus went out again beside the sea. The whole crowd gathered around him and he taught them. As he was walking along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner in Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were also sitting with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many who followed him. When the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard this, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. Thank you, David. Thank you, Sue. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Last week, we talked about what it meant that the communion table, which is a sacrament recognized in the Christian tradition, is a table that can be exclusive it, within certain traditions, there are barriers to being permitted to partake of the sacrament together. But in the congregational tradition, this table is not set by me, the minister. It's not set by the deacons. It's not set by the body of the church. It is set by love itself. And there is no barrier. All people may come to the table and find a place there whether we have hearts full of certainty or hearts full of questions and seeking and exploration, regardless of where our lives have taken us before this moment. We're focusing on meals together for two more weeks because of course we're approaching Thanksgiving. 
probably, arguably, the biggest holiday in American culture. And very painfully different last year for families that could not gather, although people did create wonderful and creative ways to come together even across Zoom. The eight o'clock gathering was reminiscing about all the fun ways that they found connection last year, despite the fact that people often had to choose isolation, could not travel, couldn't be with other generations. It's a time to think about what it means to share a place at the table with other people. In the vision of Isaiah, it's a vision that's very inclusive when all nations will find that there is no longer a barrier between them. When the world will experience what love can fully mean when all people have been fully endowed with rights, with justice, with a voice, representation, when each human being is recognized as a stakeholder in the world in which we live right now. And we know that is an exercise in aspiration. Certainly, right now, often we feel like the world is very divided. And yet the vision of Isaiah and so many other sacred scriptures, ours and other scriptures, is one of finding that we all have a place at the table. And then in the story in Mark, this is a call story. Levi is Matthew, the disciple Matthew. Most of us are familiar with the call story of Jesus and going and talking to fisher folk and calling them away from their vocations. But Jesus, in the way that he lived his life, because he chose the most marginalized people, the most unexpected people to socialize with, to sit down and eat with, to keep company with, changed the heart of a man called Levi, who was a tax collector and inhabited a very ambiguous position between the Jewish people and the Roman government. He was persona non grata almost everywhere. And to sit down with Levi, with Matthew, or anyone else was already astonishing. But then there were people who were critiquing all those with whom Matthew and Jesus chose to keep company. All it says is the word sinner, so use your imagination. We've heard plenty of other stories about who Jesus decided he would sit down with people that occupy different stations economically or gender identities, people that came with spotty histories, people that had money, people who had no money, people that were ill in ways that were socially unacceptable. Jesus made sure there were places at the table for the most unlikely of people. And it is indeed an extension of the vision that we hear in texts like Isaiah. I sent out a reflection this week about commentaries about what it means to have a place at the table and two commentators speaking from very different kinds of stakeholder groups both said, if you don't have a place at the table, you're on the menu. Imagine. Imagine what it means not to be welcome to the table in our day and time, to not have a voice or representation, to not have your interests be heard and your well being taken into consideration. Again, the vision of people all being equally represented or having a fulfilling experience, even with our own democracy within it, is an aspirational one. But when we think about sitting down together this Thanksgiving, or when we think about what it was like last week when we made sure everybody heard, you can partake of our sacrament, you can be part of this community if you so choose. There is no barrier. It's more than aspirational. It is part of what it means to live as a people of faith who believe 
that love has the final say, that love is the ultimate word and action and choice that we take. It is tangible, it is meaty, it makes a difference in other people's lives, and it is how we change the world, one life, one heart at a, ma at a time. And I don't mean because we're going out to evangelize and convert everybody to our way of thinking. I simply mean that whoever you are and wherever you come from, I recognize your value, your dignity, and I recognize that your experience, your beliefs all hold a place at the same table that is set for me too. I've talked about agape meals before, but one of the people at the eight o'clock, Dawson, was remembering sitting down at an agape meal. Does anybody know what an agape meal is? Raise your hand if you do. Alan knows, Sue knows, okay. So an agape meal, they do this a lot at summer camps. At Horton Center, we do this, and then we reflect on it afterwards. You sit down at a group table, and everything you need is either on the table or already placed on your plate. But the instruction for an agape meal is that you pay attention to the needs of other people. If somebody needs a refill on their water or they want you to pass the salt, you need to pay attention to what they might need because at an agape meal, nobody can ask for what they need. You are quiet and you focus on the other and someone else hopefully is focusing on you so that at the end of the meal, you got the refill on your water. You got a serving of everything that was on the table. You got the seasoning you hoped or the dessert that you were waiting all that time for. What you needed was offered to you because somebody else saw you and paid attention to you. Invariably, people get to talking, we get distracted, and we lose focus and somebody is missed at the table. And so at the end of a meal like that, when we talk about what it was like to sit there together, we ask, how did that go? What did you learn? And usually there are a couple people who say, well, I never got any potatoes, or I didn't get the juice, or I really wanted milk for my coffee. People get overlooked. And they were sitting right next to you and somehow you missed something that they really, really wanted. And all you had to do was ask and see them. And it is still so easy to overlook our neighbors, even sitting at the same table. So it's a wonderful lived experience that you don't really forget once you've had an agape meal. It, make, it changes the way you might notice other people at other tables going forward. But I want to tell you another example of how putting multiple people at the same table is working in our valley right now. The Way Station, which many of you know, is a nonprofit that is the first response to homelessness in this valley. Until two years ago, we had only do documented one homeless person. Now, when we do federal counts, we document between 97 to 100 people on a given day. Homelessness in this valley looks very different than it does in concentrated urban areas. People take tents and sleeping bags all year long. 25% of people are living outside somewhere. 25% of people may be living in their car. It may not even run, but it's a form of shelter and maybe they're running it all night long for heat. 25% of people are living in a temporary environment like a motel or a hotel and may have been there for a few years by now if they're fortunate. And others are couch surfing or may have a very questionable access to shelter places that don't have a septic system or don't have hot running water or don't have electricity, places that are less than conducive to a decent human experience. This nonprofit has a board of directors, three of whom are ministers because, you know, we pay attention to stuff, one of whom is Jeanette. We have many volunteers from this church and other faith communities. The nonprofit itself is not a religious entity. Our fifth board of director member is a public health nurse doing her PhD work at Dartmouth, very passionate about those that we are serving. And we're just welcoming a sixth member of 
the board, and this is what I want to share with you. We've had a couple of retreats where we gathered in a barn at a great big table, and we were lucky enough to receive a grant to do strategic planning for how we get past meeting the most basic day-to-day -day needs of someone and start to think about housing, um, changing somebody's economic outlook for the long term, all kinds of bigger ideas. And so we've been thinking long-term grand ideas, but then we've been thinking about the action items will get us there. And the voice that we had not had until these recent exercises was somebody who had been our client, a homeless person, a person who has experienced housing insecurity. You all met John Gavreau not so long ago. He came here, we interviewed him, and he shared with us his journey about living in his Jeep for the last few years. John has been volunteering at the way station. He has two jobs now. He has been able to secure housing, so he's no longer living in his Jeep. But his experience is an intense one. And he's been part of our strategic planning for the last few weeks when we get together and sit at the table. And we keep having these conversations about even if you're lucky enough to have a place at the table, sometimes you still feel like you don't belong there. You feel the imposter syndrome, like, I'm not sure I have anything to add or contribute. I feel intimidated by the other people that I'm surrounded by. And so we keep having to pause and listen to each other and admit that we all feel vulnerable in that way, right at that table. That John, when he feels new and uncomfortable, is not alone, but that we hear his human experience and that sometimes he hesitates before he shares, but when he says something, it changes how we think about the table, about what we are doing in response to one of many human or environmental crises in this part of the world. When we think about sitting at the table together, let us remember that not everybody has a place at the table. What would it feel like to be on the menu instead of those who have a voice or a place? And knowing that, realize that you don't have to change the whole system, but one life at a time by recognizing the humanity of another person. You are widening the invitation. You are widening the presence of love embodies as justice and healing for all people. When Christ says in Mark 2 that he has come to heal not the righteous but the sinners, healing is to be reconnected to your community. It isn't that he goes around and heals all the lepers and brings them to the table. It is that those who have been cut off or disconnected are being reconnected and given a place of recognition and a voice in the community. And perhaps those who are, who are criticizing the table need healing more than everyone else because they too, whether they know it or not, are connected to the same community and they're missing the chance to sit down with others who will change their lives forever. This is the invitation. Thanks be to God. So if you want to rise, we're going to sing the doxology, which is on page 44 of the red hymnal. And we also remind you at this time, we no longer pass the plates, but there are plates up front and there's a basket out back. If you want to make a contribution to the church, we appreciate your faithful giving. You can also go online to jxncc.org and make donations that way. But please turn to page 44 of the doxology.
ending, we're going to then sing Called as Partners in Christ Service, page 353. And we're going to move from that directly into the benediction, the words of which are printed in the bulletin. So if you're able to stay standing for the songs, you are welcome to do so. Um, we're going to do four verses. Four verses. Brothers and sisters, go in peace and enjoy the shared meals that come to you this week as you embody love in the world. Go in peace. Mm -hmm.